All right, good morning. How's everyone doing on this Independence Day weekend? <laughs> All right. Yeah, you see, I'm trying to be patriotic myself. But, you know, uh, something that they don't teach about in schools today, but the reason we have our independence in this country and the freedoms that we have, you can pretty much thank the Baptists for that. There probably would not have been a Revolutionary War without the Baptists. There would not have been, there definitely would not have been a First Amendment to the Constitution without the Baptists. You need to study your history. You know, they, they, uh, I heard someone saying, it was someone that I grew up with, and he's traveling in Canada and was just thankful that he was not going to be in America for, or in the United States for the 4th of July because of, you know, just how terrible things are. You know, Roe v. Wade was overturned, and he's a flaming liberal is what he is. But um, <laughs> and anyway, uh, that and, you know, we, we need to um, celebrate like in Canada where they have freedom from religion and all that. It's like, do you even know anything about history? But anyway, it's like arguing with a brick wall, so I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Study your history. There's a lot of history that is in this country that you can thank the Baptists for and the freedoms that we have. It's all because of what we have stood for. Uh, when this country was being founded, uh, many of you know, if, uh, if you've seen my video on the subject, uh, there were, they were actually pushing to have four official religions in this country. But the Baptists said, and the Baptists were going to be one of them. And they said, no, we don't want that. We don't want taxpayer money. We don't want any of that stuff. We want freedom of religion, which had uh, the only Baptist colony in America was Rhode Island, and their, their charter, the, the, the document that allowed them to come into existence, was a model for the First Amendment to the U.S. Constitution because it, it's all thanks to the Baptists. So, you know, a study about, uh, I think is uh, John Leland, was it? But study about him and, you know, the other ones, Schubel Stearns and... Samuel Harris, uh, they're the reasons that we have the freedoms that we do today. So just a little word about that since it's the 4th of July uh, coming up on Monday. But I hope you have a great Independence Day and uh, celebrate and enjoy the freedoms that we do still have for the moment in our country. But Acts chapter 12, Acts chapter 12, we've been studying about Peter's prison break. And Peter was taken by Herod Agrippa I, and he was put in prison. Uh, Herod had already killed James, the brother of John. Now, somebody asked me uh, last week about, uh, you know, it, James, the brother of John, is, is that the James that wrote the book of James? I thought that hadn't been written yet. No different James. There were, there were two people named James. There, there, were, there, were lots of, there were lots of Marys. There were lots of names that were used by several different people people, uh, there were actually two Jameses. There was James, the brother of John, John the Apostle. James, he was also an apostle, one of the twelve that followed the Lord Jesus. Uh, he and John, along with Peter, were up on the Mount of Transfiguration with the Lord Jesus. He was one of the key disciples there. Well, Herod has already killed him. Now, uh, the other James, the one that wrote the book of James, is actually the half-brother of our Lord Jesus. So they are um, two different Jameses that were there. This is James the Apostle, the one that walked with the Lord Jesus for three years. James, the brother of Jesus, actually did not believe on him until after he had risen from the dead. So uh, at this point, uh, this is probably around the time when that James was beginning to serve God. So, uh, but... James had been killed by the sword, uh, with the sword, by Herod, and uh, Herod was getting ready to do the same to Peter. Peter was put in prison. We talked about how he, you know, they had guards everywhere. There were two guards chained to him. There was no way Peter was getting out of this prison, but something happened. The church prayed for him. That's what made the difference. Now, ultimately, the reality is there is no power directly in prayer. Our prayers do not do anything except speak to God. The power is from God, but that power is accessible to us through prayer. That's why we say, oh, there's power in prayer. Yeah, there is. You have access to that power, God's power. 
It's God that does. It's God that released Peter from, from prison that day. It's God that sent the angel that appeared and, and uh, nobody noticed except Peter and even him. He, he had to kick him in the side to wake him up because he was so uh, he wasn't worried about what was happening the next day. He was just there out cold, uh, didn't seem to have a care in the world. And the angel had to kick him to wake him up. So here's Peter and the angels appeared has broken him out of prison, he's taken him out, but all of that was the result of prayer. There is great power that we have access to through prayer, and I don't think we avail ourselves of that very much these days. Uh, if you look back in history, uh, many of you will remember somebody by the name of uh, Charles Spurgeon. He was a preacher in the 1800s over in England. He was uh, one of the greatest preachers in uh, modern times, we'll call it, you know, 1800s being, you know, semi-modern. Uh, he was one of the greatest preachers that uh, we, we, we know of. And he was there in England and spent a number of years preaching there. And multitudes came to hear, they came from all around the world just to hear Spurgeon, go to the Spurgeon's Tabernacle. Uh, at that time, it was called the Metropolitan Tabernacle. But go over there and hear him preach. He's called the Prince of Preachers. He was the greatest preacher of his day. But but when he was asked, Spurgeon, Charles, <clears throat> what is it that makes a difference in your ministry? What is it that makes your ministry so much more successful than this guy down the road that has 10 people in his church? You want to know what his reply was? Well, I'm just such a great preacher, that's why they come out to hear me. No, that wasn't it. They sa he said the difference was prayer. Every time he preached... He had 200 men in a room that was directly below where he was preaching at that were praying the entire time, praying that souls would be saved, praying that lives would be changed, praying for the services during that time so that he would have liberty to preach the gospel and would have that influence that, that he felt the Lord would have him have. It was prayer that made the difference there. If, if you've been part of our prayer meetings here in, in uh, the Saturday or Sunday evenings, rather, uh, before church, that the, it's prayer that will make a difference in our church. Do you know why people come and visit the church? Why come, people come in from outside? Why the radio ministry has the effect it does? All of this. It's because of prayer. It's not because pastor is some kind of great organizational leader or something like that. And, and I appreciate our pastor. I love our pastor, but that's not what will make the difference. His preaching is only as strong as the prayers that are supporting it. Prayer is important. Prayer made the difference here. It, it said in verse 5 that prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. So we need to have prayer. We need to have it in our homes. We need to have it in our church. We need to have it in our nation to be sure. Uh, the, the reason our country is in the state it's in right now is because we have not been a praying people in a long time. Now, there was a time in the past where prayer was very important. Church was important. All these things were important. But now, our country has turned its back upon God. And if you, you can argue that if you want, but I mean, just turn on your TV, you can see it. It, even, even go into most Christians' homes and look at how they live, you can see it. But we need to get back to prayer. You know, everything that's going on in this country, we don't need political change. You know, uh, when President Trump was running for election the first time, he was, you know, we had that motto, MAGA, you know, make America great again. And yeah, we need to make America great again. But making him president or bringing in Republicans, or anything like that, or any kind of political change, that will not make a bit of difference in this country. There's only one thing that can make great America great again, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to turn this country back to, back to God, and we do that not through great preaching, we do that through prayer. Remember we mentioned uh, 2 Chronicles 7.14? But, but if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. It's prayer that will make a difference. It's prayer that made a difference in this passage that we're reading here. So, the church was praying. God sent his angel. 
broke Peter out of prison. Peter's walking through the street now. Uh, the, the angel has left him. And he, he, if, at first, if you remember, he, he didn't even believe what was going on. You know, when we pray, we need to believe in order to see our prayers answered. Now, there, there may be times that God maybe wants to teach us a lesson or something and, you know, and will answer our prayers even though we don't maybe believe as much as we ought to. But uh, Peter here, he, he, he didn't believe what was going on. And the church, we're going to find out in a minute, which we kind of touched on this last week, they didn't even believe. They, they were like, no, this is, this is a mistake. No, absolutely. No, that's not Peter outside. But uh, so he's here. He's now, the angels left him, and he's like, oh, well, I guess this really is happening. And so where does he go to? The church. The place where they were praying for him. He went there to go and meet with those people because he knew that you know, out here, I'm still in the world. I'm still in danger. They can come out. The guards could come out right now and arrest me again, put me back in there, put me to death. So I better go where I know there's people who are going to love and care for me. He went to the church. I hope that's the case in our church, that people love and care for you here. You know, but anyway, that's where he went. And so he goes there and he begins knocking. And that's about where we left it off last week. Was uh, We saw that somebody came and answered the door. So let's go to verse... 13. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. I love Rhoda. I told you this is, in my opinion, the next verse is one of the funniest verses in all of Scripture. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. So Peter's there at the gate. Hey, let me in. Wait, it's Peter. And instead of opening the door and letting Peter in, she runs in to tell everybody first. <laughs> uh, so poor Peter's out there, you know, waiting for the next uh, round of guards to come walking through the street and come arrest him. And he's, pray uh, he's knocking at the door saying, hey, let me in. I'm still out here, guys. So she runs in and verse 15. And they said unto her, see, we knew God was going to answer our prayer. And Peter's here. He's released and everything's great. Is that what they said? No. No. It says, but they said unto her, thou art mad. They said, you're crazy. There's no way Peter's out there. Why did we say that was? It's because they were thinking that in the morning, Herod was just going to have a change of heart, you know, in response to their prayers. But, you know, and then he'd say, oh, Peter, I'm sorry. Here, you can go free and let him go. That's what they were expecting. But God, who is his he, he always does beyond what we can even imagine. Uh, it says <clears throat> this in, uh, find the verse here, so I don't mess it up like I did the other, night, other day. But, oh yeah, Ephesians 3.20. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. God can do more than you can even imagine. These people, they imagined one thing in response to their prayers. They were praying for something, but God said, no. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do beyond what you expect. I'm going to send my angel to break Peter out of an impossible situation without them even knowing about it. And that's how he ended up there at their doorstep, and they couldn't believe it. You know, that, that's how we are sometimes with our prayers. When God answers a prayer, you know, we pray, you know, oh, Lord, uh, you know, I've got this diagnosis of cancer or my wife has cancer or something like that. You know, please, Lord, do something in this, you know, help her through it, you know, give her strength, all this, you know, we pray all this and then God takes the cancer away. It's like, wait a minute, how'd that happen? Well, that's the God we serve. The God that parted the Red Sea is still the God that we serve today and he's the one that we're praying to. Is anything too hard for God? God? God broke Peter out of prison, and the guards that were literally chained to him didn't even notice he was gone. And we'll see what happens to them in a moment. So, Peter is now out of prison. He's there. Rhoda has come to the door, answered the door, didn't let him in, goes in, tells everybody, they said you're mad, but verse 15 continues. But she constantly affirmed that it was even so. And they said, it is his angel. They're still not believing. They're, they're like, well, maybe, you know, maybe it's an angel that, in, you know, appearing to be Peter or, you know, his guardian angel is here or, uh, or maybe whatever the case may be. They're imagining something because they still can't believe that it could possibly be Peter. But then they answer the door. Verse 16. But Peter continued knocking. And when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. 
Wow, how did this happen? They could not believe it. We need to believe in order to have our prayers answered. It says over in Matthew 21, 22, And all things whatsoever ye ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. And when, when we're, we're kind of on the fence, you know, well, maybe he will, maybe he won't. This is what it says in James 1, 6 through 8. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. It's this back and forth thing. Oh, maybe, maybe not. And when, when God answers a prayer for someone like that, you know what they're going to say? Wow, it's wonderful. God did this for me. No, they're going to say, well, you know, maybe God answered my prayer or maybe it just happened that way. I don't know. It, first of all, what kind of faith is that? None. And what kind of testimony is that to the world? Well, maybe he did, maybe he didn't. I don't know. Uh, that, no testimony. So when God does something exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, and there is no question that it was God that did it, and again, like with our country, if you look back in history, there is no question that it's God that the reason we are here today is because of God. There is no way we won that war just on our own. You, if you look at history, God did that. So anyway, so prayer, we need to have prayer. And they were astonished and they, were, they didn't know what to think because of uh, that, that Peter was there about at the, at the door. You know, there was a difference between Rhoda's reaction and their reaction. Rhoda, what, what did she do? She got so excited that she forgot to let Peter in. She got excited because God answered her prayer. She, she, uh, the, her faith, she could accept that, yeah, this really is Peter, and, and thought, you know, well, it's incredible what God has done. These other people are like, no, there has to be some other explanation. You need to get excited about what God does in your life. If you get up here and you teach Sunday school or you do something, you know, with the kids back there or anything, and, and you don't get excited about God's word, you don't get excited about God's, what God's doing in your life, uh, that's, let me put it this way. If I stood up here and I taught this lesson like this, and then, then Rhoda came to hearken and she was excited, you know, does it sound like I'm excited? <laughs> no! <laughs> Get excited about God's Word. Get excited about what God is doing. That's how other people will get engaged. You know, I'm, I'm not necessarily more interesting than someone else that might be teaching this passage, but I, I'm allowing it to get me excited because God's doing stuff in my life. God, I, I've seen God answer prayers in my life, and it's something I want to share with you that, that wow, it, this God that's done all this for me can do it for you too. Get excited about God's Word. Making God's Word boring, I, I would say it's almost criminal to do that. Uh, get excited about God's Word. God truly is great. He is powerful. He is good. He is loving. He's all these things. Get excited about it. So, him that is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think. That's who we serve. That's the God we serve. In fact, it says over in 1 Corinthians 2, 9, and mind you, this passage, you know, we, we, look, we read this verse that I'm about to share with you and think, oh, this, this is, you know, talking about heaven and how great heaven's going to be. No, this is talking about in this life. It says this, but as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. That's not talking about heaven. Heaven is going to be all that, absolutely. But that's talking about here in this life. That, that God is doing something in us and through us that is so great that we can't even imagine it. You know, we sometimes, we, we doubt God and uh, we, we, we don't think that God's going to answer our prayer or something. Um, there's, uh, I, I took a trip, and I know I've told many of you this before, but uh, it, it, some, some maybe haven't heard it, so I'll quickly go through this story again. But uh, I was taking a trip to Scotland one time. And it was while I was stationed in England. And uh, before I left, I had, we had problems with the, the car was leaking a little bit of oil and stuff. And, and so I checked the oil, and the oil was a little bit low. So I put in a quart of oil into the, into the engine there. Then we drove up to Scotland. 
And then we drove from where we were staying in Scotland, we drove up into the Highlands, up by Loch Ness and all around the uh, Inverness and that whole area up there. And then we came back to where, we were headed back to where we were, and we were actually coming up around the backside of Loch Ness. And I noticed uh, smoke coming up off the engine. I smelled smoke and, you know, a burning smell and all this. And I was like, oh no, what's going on? And so I pulled into the first gas station I found, which in that area, there were no gas stations. You know, the, the fact that there was even a gas station for us to pull into was a miracle of God, because there was nothing around there. But uh, we pulled into this gas station, which was immediately there, and I got out and I got some oil and everything, put it in the car, because uh, it, what had happened was when I had put the oil in, I forgot to put the cap back on. I had left it on top of the engine, but of course it was gone from there, no sign of it anywhere. And so uh, I, I put the oil in there, and then I went back in, and I, I asked them uh, up there that said, you know, hey, do you have anything that'll fit my car? Oh, no, mate, we haven't got anything like that. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, we, we, I put the oil in there, and I was like, I, as I was walking out to the car, I was praying and saying, Lord, I know this is impossible, but please help me to find that oil cap. Uh, I, I'd how could it be anywhere? It was on top of the engine and it's gone now, but, but Lord, please let me allow, allow me to find it. And I will be honest, I did not expect in a million years that God was going to answer that prayer. But I walked out to the car and I started looking around, and of course it wasn't on top of the engine. And I looked down, you know, lower in the engine compartment and everything, and I looked down where the front axle was and I said, what is that? And I couldn't reach it by hand, so I grabbed a wrench and I reached down there and I tapped it and it was the oil cap and it fell straight to the ground. There was nothing holding it in. It was just sitting there. And I, I imagine that for the 900 miles through the mountains that we had just driven, that an angel was flying along with his uh, hand on that oil cap saying, will you please stop? <laughs> but uh, um, it's God answered my prayer despite my unbelief. And I learned something that day which is probably why God answered the prayer in the first place, was so that I would learn that lesson. God still answers prayer, even impossible prayers. We just need to trust Him and rely upon Him, and He will answer our prayers. He'll take care of us. So, He answered the prayer. Uh, Peter's there at the door, and uh, verse... 16, we said they were astonished. Verse 17, but he beckoning unto them with the hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the, how the Lord had brought him out of, out of the prison. And he said, go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. So they were all astonished and they were saying, wow, Peter, this is great. This is wonderful. How, how did you ever get out of there? And, and, and they were all excited about Peter. And Peter stops them and says, hey, wait a minute. We need to put the focus where it belongs, on what God did. So he told them, hold your peace, and declared unto them how the Lord had gotten him out of prison. It, it, it wasn't him. It, was, it wasn't about him. It was about the Lord. So he put the, the focus where it belongs. Do we do that when God answers our prayer? Do we direct all, you know, say, wow, you know, that's incredible. You know, you, you, uh, this happened in your life. Wait, 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 no. This didn't just happen. The Lord did it. Give him the credit for what he does in our lives. He wants the glory, and he's the only one worthy of that glory. If we accomplish something, it's not because of us. It's because of the Lord, and we need to give him the credit for it. So Peter's here, you know, he's saying, look, don't, don't look at me. Look at what the Lord has done, and then go tell James. Remember we said there were two Jameses? This is the other one. This is the half-brother of the Lord Jesus. So uh, I say half-brother because they have the same mother, different father. Uh, the father of the Lord Jesus was the Holy Spirit. Uh, he had no earthly father. So anyway, so a couple of things about prayer. God wants to answer our prayers. We already talked about that. It says in Psalm 37, verses 4 and 5, Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. Which I've heard that verse used to you know, say, Oh, God's going to give me anything I want. That's actually part of what it's saying, but there's more to it than that. Uh, first of all, it's also a condi conditional promise. It's commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. But when it says that God will give you the desires of your heart, that's twofold. First of all, 
where are you getting those desires from in the first place? Those desires are coming from God because you have committed thy way unto the Lord, trusted also in him, and then he, he's going to bring that to pass. He's giving you those desires in your heart to begin with. And then when he, in turn, fulfills those desires, if he gave you that desire, doesn't he want to give you whatever it is you're desiring? So it's all, again, about him and what he's doing in our hearts. It's not about God's going to give you anything you want. So if you want that new Mercedes, just pray for it and claim it, you know, uh, and God's going to give it to you. No, it has nothing to do with that. In fact, in 1 John 5, 14, it says this, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us according to his will. Not our will. Sometimes we want things that actually aren't in our best interest. Sometimes we want things that are not according to God's will. It's according to his will. We, that's why when we pray, sometimes we'll say, you know, hey, uh, you know, Lord, w whatever your will is in this situation, that's what I want. It's because it's all about him, not us. So, so Peter's there. Uh, he knocks. Uh, they, they let him in. He uh, speaks to them, says, go tell everybody. You know, go tell James. Go tell the brethren. Okay. Now, verse 18 through the end of the chapter, we have the rest of the story, which we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. But basically, uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and read through a little bit of it. It says, now, as soon as it was day, there was no small stir among the soldiers what was become of Peter. Remember, they, did, they were chained to him, and they had no idea what happened to him. And they're like, well, I don't know. You know, Herod's going to come up, uh, verse 19. And when Herod had sought for him and found him not, he examined the keepers and commanded that they should be put to death. And when he, and he went down from Judea to Caesarea and there abode. So Herod comes in and says, okay, I'm ready to kill Peter now. Where is he? And the guards were like, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know what happened to him. He's just gone. And he's like, you're lying. And he put him to death. So verse 20. And Herod was highly displeased of the, with them of Tyre and Sidon, and they came with one accord to to him, and having made Blastus, the king's chamberlain, their friend, desired peace because their country was nourished by the king's country. So this, these other cities, they, they were under Herod's jurisdiction, and uh, Herod was not happy with them, and so they're trying to make peace with Herod right now. But something happens. Verse 21. And upon a set day, Herod arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon the, his throne, and made an oration to them, to the people that he was, you know, dealing with, and they, the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a god and not of a man. Ooh, that's dangerous. You know, there, there's a few people in, in Scripture that wanted to be God. None of them turned out well. First of all, there was Satan. Remember Lucifer? Uh, the five I wills of, uh, of Lucifer. One of them, you know, I will be like the Most High. I want to be like God. Well, the job was taken, and now he's the devil. So then there was Adam and Eve, you know, Eve in the garden. What did Satan say to her? Said, oh, you know, in the day that thou eatest thereof, your eyes shall be opened, uh, and you shall be as gods. She wanted to be like God and no good and evil. Well, that didn't work out well, and the human race was plunged into sin. You know, and Adam took as well, which uh, Eve was deceived, Adam was not. But we don't have time to go into that. All right, and then there's the Antichrist who's still coming. You know, he's going to sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, claiming, hey, everybody worship me because I'm God. He's not going to end up well either. In fact, he will be the, uh, one of the two first residents of the Lake of Fire. So uh, I, that's a designation or, you know, a, a privilege that I would not want to have myself. So... Never a good thing when people start calling you a god and you say, oh yeah, that sounds good. Well, that's exactly what Herod's doing here. It's the voice of a god, not of a man. Verse 23, and immediately, not after an hour, immediately the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory and he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. Ooh, does not sound like a pleasant way to go. So, all right, so that's what happened to Herod. But Peter and the church, they're continuing on. Verse 24. But the word of God grew and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry and took with them John, whose surname was Mark. Okay, so 
Now, Peter has been released from prison. He, he's, well, by the angel. He broke out of prison, basically. Uh, so he's here. He's in the, but Peter is now fading from the scene in the book of Acts. You know, it's, this isn't the last time we see Peter, but it's the last major event from Peter's life that we have here. Now, we still have the books of First and Second Peter that he went on to write. So God did not stop using Peter, but he is no longer going to be the focus of the book of Acts. It is now shifting over to this new individual who's called Saul right here. We don't find him called Paul until the very next chapter, but God is going to begin using this individual. Up to this point, really, he hasn't been a very major character. He hasn't done a whole lot. He, he's preached the word. He's convinced many. He has made an impact on a small level, but nothing like what he is going to do in the rest of the book of Acts. So here is when we begin pick up, picking up the story of Paul. And do you remember who it was that made a difference in Paul's life and brought him to the point where he was actually starting to really serve the Lord? It was Barnabas. That's right. And so uh, Barnabas, he, he had gone to Paul. Saul, Paul, he was off in Tarsus. He had gone home. You know, he had gotten a little bit discouraged uh, over what happened in Jerusalem. But now he's, Barnabas has gotten him out into the church at Antioch. He's been serving there. He was serving there for a period, period of time. And now they've sent Paul and Barnabas down to Jerusalem to bring them an offering that had been taken up for them. And they had finished that ministry down there in Jerusalem. In verse 25, we saw that they are now going back to Antioch. And that's where God's going to really begin to use him. Now, he's already been serving the Lord which that's important. We'll talk about that another time. But he's been serving the Lord. Now God is going to give him more to do. You want to be used of God? Get busy about serving him now. You know, God doesn't use people who sit on the sidelines. God uses people who are in the fight, who are working and serving him all the time. That's all we have time for. Let's go ahead and have a prayer and uh, just thank God for what he's doing in our lives. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we again come to you now. We, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this, uh, this account of what happened to Peter and, and how it teaches us uh, about prayer and, and trusting you. And I just pray that you'd help us to trust you more and more each day. I pray that we'd see our prayers answered, not for our uh, benefit or, or anything like that, but rather for your glory. And help us to be faithful to give you the glory when you do something in our lives. We love you, Lord, and we ask this all in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.